Good morning, everyone. Good to see you today. Welcome to our service. There are people still coming in, so as they take their seats, I want to do a call to worship today from Psalm 34, and I am going to read verses 1 through 3, so please listen as I read these words of King David from Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So I'm going to ask you to stand as we begin our time of worship together this morning.
Thank you, worship team. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, what you've brought to my mind today is Isaiah chapter 6, where the prophet Isaiah comes into the very throne room of God and is reminded of who you are. And we've been reminded in this song that we've just sung that you are our good, good heavenly Father. And what you're all about is love towards us. And Lord, for the prophet Isaiah, he also realized again and was reminded of who he was, that he had unclean things, unclean things that came from his lips and that he was a sinner. Lord, we are reminded today that yes, we are sinners that are saved by grace and that we are now the saints of God and who we are are the loved ones of God, that you love us and love us and love us with an everlasting love. So Lord, allow us to take all of that in today, into our minds, but more importantly, into our hearts, to realize again who you are, that you are almighty God, all powerful, all loving, merciful, gracious towards us, and that we are your children, your servants, your saints, the ones set apart to give you the praise and glory. So we come to this place today to do that very thing, to give you the praise and the glory that you deserve because you are almighty God and you have done good, good things. So Lord, guide and direct our time together this morning for the children and for their leaders and their groups and for the teenagers. Lord, for us here, adults in this room, Lord, guide and direct our thoughts as we enter into the Word of God in a few moments. Lord, allow us to apply the Word of God, not just to be hearers of your Word, but to be doers of your Word. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Again, welcome to our service. For those that are on Facebook Live, welcome today. Those who will be watching on YouTube, thank you for joining us today. We are going to dismiss our children, so you can go off in that direction at this time. So thank you to the adults that are leading them today. Okay, for those in this room, I want you to direct your attention towards the screen. We are going to have a missionary update from our missionaries, um, the Thompsons that serve in Africa. And so let's go and watch the video now. Good morning, church family. I am Jerry Anna Harvey, as you know, from the missions team. And we are blessed with seeing uh, Ralph Thompson this morning and his wife, Sandra, is not with us, but Ralph is here to give us an update of uh, what he's doing, what his ministry is doing through World Venture. So I'm just going to let you take it away. Yeah, good to, uh, well, be with you virtually, I guess. Uh, the It would definitely be better to be in person, but glad I can be here with you virtually. Um, yeah, the last few years I've been serving as the Global Muslim Initiatives Coordinator for World Venture. And really my role involves encouraging and equipping God's people to uh, to love our Muslim neighbors well and to bear fruit among them. So as you might imagine, um, encouraging people to engage Muslims in the area could be quite challenging, especially here in the U.S. Um, and I guess that would be one one of the uh, uh, couple challenges that I would say uh, in dealing with this role is, you know, since so September 11th and all the last couple decades of history behind terrorist attacks, um, people just have a lot of fear when it comes to Muslims. Um, some people, um, you know, it's not just here in the U.S., but other parts of the world, too, just a lot of hatred toward Muslims. And so really looking at scripture and trying to understand, okay, what is God, how does God feel about these people and how might that pull my heart in alignment with his in regards to reaching these people and identifying them? You know, m many times we don't even realize that uh, Muslims are living among us. And so what does that look like? And 
Yeah, so that's uh, that's one of the challenges I face in in this role. Um, but I love it. This is an area that God has burdened my heart for. And it all goes back to a, a, a relationship with a gas station attendant. Uh, when I was going through Bible college in the Boston area, uh, I got to know this Muslim gentleman and he would just throw so many challenges out there. Um, and so it really drove me to want to learn more about Islam and God just broke my heart for these people. And so, yeah, that that's, uh, you know, one of the um, core and uh, elements of my role is just helping people identify and training them to reach Muslims uh, in their area. Some of the things that are going well um, in my role, the, one of the um, one of the key goals that I have is understanding how God is moving around the world. And so it's been really neat to be part of some global networks that have a heart for Muslims where God's people have put their denominational differences aside to say, how can we collaborate? How can we work together? How can we share information in order to join hands to, to reach this common goal of seeing Muslims around the world reached? And so several of these networks that I'm involved in have been, have done extensive research looking at, um, successful church planting efforts among Muslims and what we can learn from them. So as I train others, being part of these networks to understand how God is moving in different parts of the world has been extremely valuable. And, you know, I, I look at ministry sometimes as it's sort of like sailing, right? If the winds shift, you, you have to adjust the sails in order to maximize the wind's potential. And so um, the spirit of God often moves like that. You know, he'll he'll use different things in different time periods of history to bring people to himself. So um, that's one of the things that I would say is has been encouraging in my role is connecting with uh, these different networks around the world and just hearing the stories of how God is saving Muslims and how in some some parts entire families and entire communities of Muslims are coming to faith in Christ. And so those, those are so encouraging. And of course, you always want to see what we can learn and, and how we can uh, be effective in our context, wherever God has placed us. Yeah, Sandra is now serving as a pre-field mentor with World Venture. So she helps uh, take, um, our new appointees from the time they're appointed all the way to the time they get on the airplane to go serve overseas. And so uh, she's involved in the regular uh, helping them reach their growth goals, uh, the different requirements that the mission has, the different medical things. And she just walks with them through that process and is kind of like their cheerleader and their coach, if you will, at times to, to help them uh, get to the field. So yeah, she seems to really be thriving in this new role and enjoying it. Um, and a couple times a year, uh, World Venture has, um, they call it cultural and ministry prep training at the home office in the Denver area. So it's been fun to travel with her because her role as a mentor, she's very involved in that, but they've also been utilizing me as a trainer to help teach some of the cultural classes and theology of risk and suffering and, and some of those very practical uh, ways that we can help prepare our new workers for missionary life overseas. So yeah, there has been aspects of our two roles that have merged, which is always fun. Amen. Well, thank you, Jerry, and, and thanks really to the whole UBC family. I mean, you guys have been partnering with us now for almost two decades, so that's that's hard to fathom, and we're just so grateful and appreciate each of you. Okay, let's take a moment and let's pray for Ralph and Sandra in their new roles. 
Lord, we thank you for this couple that for these last few decades have dedicated their lives to going first overseas to Africa and now going even in a greater role to help multiple people prepare to go to serve among um, Muslim people around the world. So Lord, today we just pray for both Ralph and Sandra. They will soon be uh, traveling in their uh, responsibilities. So Lord, give them safety as they travel. Lord, I just pray that you would give them great wisdom, give them great ability to work with all kinds of various uh, people and personalities, and Lord, just to be able to do their, well, their jobs well. Lord, to that end, I would pray today in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, my Bible is open this morning to Luke chapter 24, and we are going to look at this passage beginning at verse 13, and in Luke 24, verse 13, in Luke 24, verse 13, it says this. Let me read it for you. Now that same day, this is the first Easter day 2,000 years ago. Jesus has just been raised from the dead that we sang about earlier. It says, now that same day, two of them, two of the disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Okay, so this is how the story begins. So I want us to put a picture up on the screen of modern-day Emmaus. Emmaus still is there today. It's, It's seven or eight miles northwest of the city of Jerusalem. And there's a Christian church there today, and named after one of these two disciples, and it's a a Catholic uh, church. In 2010, I had the privilege of actually going to Israel, going to Emmaus, and going and standing right here in front of the church. And uh, so I just want to tell you this story quickly that I've never shared publicly before, so you're hearing this for the first time. You've heard a lot about my trip to Israel, but I've never, ever shared this story before. Uh, So here it goes. So we were at the end of our week, my week in Israel. We had been there for uh, seven days. And on that Saturday, the day before Easter, we were on three buses. There were about 150 of us. And we traveled to the city of Bethlehem. It's about five miles south of Jerusalem. And we checked into the hotel, and they said, okay, everyone go to bed early tonight because the plan for tomorrow is to get up really early, like at 4.30 in the morning, to be to the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem by 5.30 a.m., and we're going to have an Easter sunrise service as the sun comes up over Jerusalem early tomorrow tomorrow morning. So we got up early, we got on the three buses, we went to the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem, and the sun began to rise in the east, and as soon as that first ray came up over the horizon, it hit the dome of the rock that's there today, that's all covered in pure gold, and it just, now that's where the, the temple was in Old Testament days. So we're overlooking that, the whole old city of Jerusalem. So we had this amazing Easter sunrise service as the sun came up overlooking Jerusalem, where Jesus had been raised from the dead 2,000 years previously. So as soon as that was over, they said, okay, we have been given special permission to go to Jerusalem, to the, the, to the western wall, where the Jewish people can go today and, and worship. And then we're going to be able to go up to the Temple Mount and, and be there. Now, this is the most sacred spot on earth, high security, because both Judaism and Islam that we've just been talking about and Christianity all claim that as their special spot. So we were able to do that. It was, it was amazing. We got back on the buses, and we went and had brunch late that Easter morning. 
And then we got back on the buses and we went back to Bethlehem. And so they said, we're going to go to the place where Jesus was born. And there's this huge church that is built there today. And we went through, stood in this long line. We went down these stairs. And then there's this little place that said, okay, this is the cave where Jesus was born. Now, to be honest with you, that was the low point of my trip. It was very disappointing. And it was like, all right, the trip is over. That's it. So we were getting back onto the buses. And they said, okay, change of plans. We're going to add something to the trip. We're going to take you back to the hotel you can rest up for an hour or so. We're going to get back on the buses, and then we're going to go to Emmaus for the evening, and we're going to have this worship service where Jesus was on the first Easter morning 2,000 years ago. And I was like, wow. So that's what we did. We get on the bus, buses. Now, you have to understand, many of you don't, uh, most people don't understand, most Americans don't understand, is that Bethlehem is controlled by the Palestinian Authority. And so when we left the city of Bethlehem to go into the territory that's controlled by the Israeli government, there's a huge, huge concrete wall that surrounds the city of Bethlehem today. And the Israelis have put that up for security reasons and because Jerusalem is just a few miles beyond that wall. So we went, the three buses, we go through that gate, that security point, we, lo- we leave Bethlehem, we go into the Israeli, uh, occupi- uh, uh, the Israeli controlled area. We drive to Jerusalem five miles and then another seven miles to Emmaus. So we get there probably about six o'clock at night. And the sun is just beginning to set. And Zachary, if you can go and put the map up there on the screen now. And so this is, this is what we did. We, we were here in Bethlehem, we went to Jerusalem and then we went out to Emmaus. So it's about 12 or 13 miles from the hotel. Now that's really important. Put that in the back of your mind as I tell you the story. So we went to, a, to Emmaus. The sun is setting in the west. If you can picture this in your mind, it's just absolutely gorgeous, beautiful. We have this mini worship service. We are singing all the Easter songs, all the Easter hymns that we typically sing here in church. And it was just the most peaceful, beautiful place. It was my, probably my favorite place, all of Israel. And so the worship service concludes. The sun is just setting below the horizon. It's just starting to get dark. So I kind of pull back. There's about 150 people there on this tour. So I kind of pull back. People are just kind of ming- mingling around, talking, getting ready to get back on the buses. And I'm just reflecting. That was like the high point of my trip. It's like, wow, what a way to end this trip. What a way to end Easter in Israel. And this is absolutely amazing. Well, about three or four feet from me over to the right is the tour guide for my bus. And so I've got to know him a little bit over the last seven or eight days. And his phone rings, and he goes and he answers it, and it's a very brief conversation. Now, this is part of the story that I've never told you before. And I can tell it's really bad news. It's a very brief conversation. He says, okay, thanks for letting me know, and bye. He puts his phone back in his pocket, and his whole face is like dropped. So I move over a few feet, and I said, is there something wrong? And he says, yes. He said, "Uh, this afternoon down in Gaza, there's been some bombings, and the Israeli government has closed off all of the territories and I'm like, okay, what does that mean? He says, uh, including Bethlehem, that gate has now been closed. And that's where we're staying the night. We can't get back there. All of our luggage is there. We can't get our luggage. We can't get anything we have. And I'm like, oh. I said, well, do they do this often? Yeah, anytime there's problems with the Palestinians. I said, how long does this typically last? And he said, hours or days or weeks. I was like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, this is not good. So he said, uh, I may need your help tonight, because I was the only pastor on the whole trip. He says, I may need your help tonight. I don't know what's going to happen. And, but he says, don't tell anybody else. And I've never publicly spoke about this until today. 
I've told a couple of people privately, maybe about four or five people. So we get back on the three buses, and we drove to Jerusalem in the pitch dark from Emmaus to Jerusalem. And we, they're playing uh, uh, worship music on the speakers. Everybody's having a great time. They're like, wow, this is like great. We drive back to Jerusalem. We go through this tunnel and this road. We, we drive all around the modern day city of Jerusalem. It's pitch dark, but all the lights. It's just this gorgeous, beautiful city. We drive around the old city. We do this for like an hour and a half. Everybody's like, wow, this is like great. This is like wonderful. In the back of the bus going, oh God, please, please help us. And after like an hour and a half, tour guide said, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are going back to Bethlehem. We're going back to our hotel and have a good night's rest. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. Now, in spite of that true story, I still love Emmaus. So, Zach, can you put that original picture back up on the screen? I love Emmaus in spite of that story. So that's the backdrop of our, of our story this morning in Luke chapter 24. So Jesus has been raised from the dead. It is now late in the afternoon on the first Easter. These two disciples of Jesus are walking along. They are leaving. They've left Jerusalem, and they're going back home to Emmaus. And Jesus joins them on this walk, which is kind of incredible. Why is Jesus uh, doing this? And so let's continue reading. So Jesus asked them, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? What's going on? What are you talking about today? They stood still, their faces downcast. The, the original Greek says that they were very sad. So here they are, very sad, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Now, I love, I love this next verse. In this question that Jesus asks, he says, What things? <laughs> what things have happened in Jerusalem in these last days? As if he didn't know anything that had happened and he was the central character in all these events. What has happened? And they go and they begin to, to share about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be, to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And it's implied here that Jesus was going to redeem Israel from the Roman occupying force. He was going to give us our country back. And that was what they had hoped for. But we had hoped for these things. And what is more is on the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. So in their minds, Jesus is dead, he's crucified, and now his body's missing. They have no hope at all. They're like, we're just going home. We're going home. So they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Uh, then some of our companions, uh, John and Peter it would have been, went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, empty. But they did not see Jesus. So the first point this morning is not what we would expect to be the first point. The first point this morning is Jesus listened. Jesus listened to the discouraged disciples. He just listened to them. They vented. They were discouraged. They were disappointed. They were maybe even angry at all the things that had happened. And Jesus simply listens to them vent. He doesn't go and say, wait a minute, I'm Jesus and I've been raised from the dead. He doesn't show them his glorified body that they fall down and worship him. Now that's how I would have written the story. But that's not how the story goes. And why is that? I think there's a purpose for why Jesus goes and 
reveals himself in the way that he does, and why Luke includes this story at the end of his book, preparing us for the book of Acts. Because what we're about to see explains to us, to the original reader and to us today, exactly why Jesus died on the cross. It wasn't that Jesus simply was a religious martyr or that Jesus was in the wrong place at the wrong time and that he was killed, that he was crucified, that he just got caught up in all the chaos of that Passover day and then had the ability to be raised from the dead. Now, that's a pretty incredible story, but that is not the story of the Bible. So let's continue to point number two. In point number two, Jesus explained to the discouraged disciples why he had to die, verses 25 through 27. Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets, all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah, the Christ, have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, all the prophets of the Old Testament, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And I've always told you that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible because I would have loved to have been there. He goes right very back to Moses and all of the prophets and the Psalms and all the way through the Old Testament. He says, now this has all been talking about the Christ and the Messiah, all talking about me. And it's all about that the Christ had to suffer and die and then be glorified. But see, the disciples, including these two disciples, had missed the whole point about suffering. And they were only focusing on the glory that Jesus, the Messiah, would one day experience. But Jesus explained to the disciples why he had to die. He says the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer and die. Jesus explains here that the very reason that the Christ would come into the world would be to suffer and to die. That was intentional plan from the very beginning of the world that Jesus would come and suffer and die and then be raised from the dead. Let's jump ahead for a moment, if we will, to verse 45. This happens a little bit later that evening. It says, Then Jesus opened their minds when he's meeting with all of the disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah, the Christ, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. But now he gives us in verse 47 the reason that he died. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name to all nations, in his name, to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So in verse 47, as we mentioned last week, that the reason that Jesus died was to forgive our sins. So he did not just simply die as a martyr or the person in the wrong place at the wrong time. He intentionally died on the cross to pay our penalty, our fine, our punishment, for all of our sin, for your sin, for my sin. So that when we repent and when we believe that we say, yes, I am a sinner and I need a savior. I need someone to forgive all of the penalty of my sin, of my wrongdoing. Jesus is that answer, that he forgives our sin. And The takeaway is this. Let's put it on the screen. Jesus had to die in order to redeem the world from sin. That's the reason that Jesus died on the cross. He had to die in order to redeem the world from sin. Now, the amazing part when I go through and read this and study Luke 24 is that Jesus focused more on the crucifixion than he did on his resurrection. You would think he would be talking all about, okay, this is how I was raised from the dead. He talks all about his death. He does that uh, three times in Luke 24. He says, must suffer. In verse 7, if you turn back to verse 7, he says, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified and on the third day be raised from the dead. 
in verse 26 that we have just read, he says the same thing. I must suffer. He must suffer and then be raised from the dead. In verses 46 and verse 47 that we've just read, this is what is written. The Messiah, the Christ, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And only twice does he mention that he'll be raised at the end of verse 7, at the end of verse 46. And so the Easter story, the Easter story is not only about that Jesus rose from the dead. That's true. But that the suffering, crucified Christ rose from the dead. So Jesus said, you cannot focus on the resurrection without focusing on the reason that I died. The death and resurrection of Jesus are equally important and they go together and so we understand that the one who was made sin is the one who has been raised from the dead second corinthians 5 21 we'll put this on the screen for the sake of time paul says god made him jesus who had no sin he was sinless to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of god So as I mentioned last week, and and just let me emphasize again today, that why did Jesus die on the cross? To forgive us of our sin, but secondly, to make us right in our standing before God. He sees us as completely right, as if we have not sinned at all. And then righteousness is also that he gives us the ability to live right, to have that changed and transformed life. And then, as I said last week, to be friends with Jesus forever. In Romans 5, 8, the one who died our death is the one who has been raised from the dead. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he die on the cross? He died for us. The one who took our place is the one who has been raised from the dead, 1 Peter 2, 24. Jesus himself bore our sins. All of our sins were transferred from us to Jesus when he was on the cross, in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins. We might have this new life where we're dead to sins. We're no longer controlled by our old sinful nature you know, saying the bad things that we say and swearing and lying and stealing and all that, and to live for righteousness, to live that new life that is right. By his wounds, you have been healed. You have been made new. So why did Jesus die on the cross? To pay our penalty, to make us right, and to be our friend forever. Now, the resurrection of Jesus was the declaration that our penalty of sin is paid in full. Romans 4, let's put that up on the screen. Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins. See, the Bible talks about this a lot. Why did he die? He died for our sins. And he was raised to life for our justification. Now, what does that mean? We talked about that again last week as well that someday when we stand before the judge, God the Father, and he says, okay, are you guilty or innocent? And say, oh, we're guilty. I'm guilty. But Jesus will be there saying, "Um, I have taken the penalty. I have paid everything. I've taken all the punishment. And this person has repented, has said, yes, I am a sinner, I need to be forgiven, and I have forgiven him, and he is now justified. See, that's a, that's a legal term. We've been justified. It's like, nope, you're all set, made just. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. Now, thirdly, back to Luke 24, Jesus revealed his identity at the dinner table. So let's go back to this uh, interesting story. So Jesus has listened to them. He's explained the scriptures to them. And now Jesus revealed his identity at the dinner table. So he says, it says in verse 28, as they approached the village, so they were coming to Emmaus, to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. 
but they urged him strongly. Uh, in the Greek language, it is that they begged him, please stay, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. It's going to be pitch dark, and this is a very dark part of the world. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, so there's the meal been prepared. Notice what it says. Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Jesus goes from being, note this, Jesus goes from being the guest to the host. And at that moment when he becomes the host, all of a sudden it says, what does it say? Their eyes are opened and they recognized him. Because he goes and as he has done in the past at the Last Supper, he goes and he takes the bread and he thanks the Lord for it, and he breaks it, and he's distributing it. All of a sudden, they're like, oh my goodness, this is Jesus sitting at our table. And their eyes are opened, and he, Jesus disappears. He vanishes from their sight. And then they ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. We, we knew there was something different about this guy, but we never imagined that this was the risen Lord Jesus. Fourth and final point. Jesus instructed his disciples to proclaim his death and resurrection to all the nations. Verse 33. These two disciples, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and those with them still in the upper room in the city of Jerusalem where they've been hiding out behind locked doors as the other gospel accounts tell us. And they're assembled together and saying, so the disciples, the 11 disciples are saying, it is true, the Lord has, been, has risen and has appeared to Simon Peter. Then these two disciples told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So Jesus instructed his disciples, and so the next thing that happens that evening is there they are in the upper room, in that house in Jerusalem, and Jesus just miraculously appears. See, with his new resurrected body, this passage is fascinating because he is able to appear and disappear. He's able to walk through walls and doors, but then he also says, do you have anything to eat? And they give him food, and he eats. It's like, whoa. Whoa. See, someday we're going to have a resurrected body just like that. It's going to be very different. Very similar to this body, but very different. But Jesus has that resurrected body, and there he is. And then, as I read earlier, he says, then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah, the Christ, will suffer and then rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, the Holy Spirit. But stay here in this city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And so Jesus goes and he sends them out. And they go to all kinds of nations, these disciples. And he tells, they tell them, everyone, the nations that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. In Luke 24, if we go back to verse 9 quickly, it says, Then they came back with the, um, from the tomb. They told all the things to the eleven. Uh, this is the, the women early on that morning. In verse 33 that we have already read, that these two disciples, they quickly get up and they go and tell, we've seen the risen Christ. In verses 47 and 48 that we've just read, Jesus says, Go and tell everyone that I have been raised from the dead. So Jesus says, he instructed his disciples to proclaim his death and resurrection to all the nations. So application. This may or may not be a familiar story to you. But what do we do? How, how, what do we do with this? How do we go and use the principles that are found in our lives today? So I want to do it this way. I want you for a moment to think of who are who are those in your circle of eight to twelve people who need to know about the risen, crucified Christ. So, so who are those eight or twelve people that are in your life all the time? 
maybe family members, uh, friends, neighbors, co-workers, uh, people that you've known for a long period of time, that you have regular contact with. They tell us there's about eight or 12 of those people in that kind of the inner circle. In that inner circle of those people who need to know this information that we've talked about today, that Jesus has risen, but he was also crucified for the sins of the world. So think of those folks for a moment. I think we can get four principles that will help us in interacting and talking with these eight or 12 people in our lives. Oftentimes in the past, I've simply said to you, pray for them. And I know you have for a long time. So these are four more things that, can, that you can do. The first is to listen to them. Because that's what Jesus does here. To listen to the people in your life. I think too often times we are more concerned about speaking than listening. Jesus took the time to listen to these people in his life. He listened for their hope, the things that they were hopeful for. He listened for their doubts and disappointments and even the things they were angry about. And if you go, and this is the question I would suggest that you ask people all around you on a regular basis, is what's happening in your life right now? Ask that simple question. What is happening in your life right now? What are the things that you're concerned about right now? Uh, high inflation, high oil prices, I mean, all those types of things. So we need to, to listen to people. Secondly, we need to ask them some questions Jesus asked some questions, didn't he? He said, um, what are you talking about? Uh, what things are you talking about? And the question, and maybe the chief question that I think of that you can ask those people closest to you on a regular basis is ask them where they are spiritually. Ask them where they are spiritually. Don't, don't do this every day or necessarily every week, but from time to time, at least maybe once or twice a year, where are you spiritually? What's, what's happening in your spiritual life? Are you, like, you know, total atheist? You know, don't believe in God at all? Or are you very religious? Or are you somewhere in between? And that's a good question to ask. Because people will be very honest with you. They're like, well, you know, it's like, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about this type of stuff, and, or I'm not at all. And if they say, well, I am, or I'm somewhat interested, then... That, that's very good. So ask the question, where are you spiritually? Thirdly, and this kind of sums up our whole sermon series over the last six or eight weeks, understand that often people, understand that often people realize who Jesus is by being in a community of Christian people. Let me read that again. Understand that often people realize who Jesus is, is by being in the community of Christian people. What I've discovered over the years, when you invite people to a simple meal and you go and you invite some Christ followers with some of those that are not yet Christ followers, and you do that repeatedly over time, even a simple meal or dessert or something like that, what will happen, and what happened to me as a young child, is I, I experienced exactly what these disciples did, this burning feeling in my heart and what is that? Because as I would hear the stories of Jesus, there was this burning feeling that it's like, I don't know if I believe any of this, but tell me more. I, 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 this, is, this, is really, this is really interesting. Or it, the more I hung out with Christian people, it's like, I don't really understand them, but I want to spend time with them because they are different. There's something different about them. They're very loving. They're very caring. And when we think about it, it's oftentimes in these types of settings, settings around a simple meal that happens usually repeatedly over and over a period of time. It's like, yeah, I'll come back again. Yeah, I, I like hanging out with you people. I'd really like you to even be my friends. And it's oftentimes in that setting not in this high-pressured setting, not even in a setting like this, that someone will say, yeah, I want to know more about Jesus. I, 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 I want to be a follower of Jesus as well. 
And then the fourth principle I think we can get from this text is help people understand the Bible. Because oftentimes what, what I've realized over the years is that people have all these different pieces of the Bible. It's like pieces of, the, of a puzzle, but they can't fit them together. Just like these disciples. They had all the pieces of the puzzle, but Jesus had to come along and say, okay, here are all the pieces of the puzzle. Let's put them together. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, okay, this, this makes sense. So another good question to ask people is, do you have questions about the Bible? What questions? Maybe we could go from having dinner to having a little Bible study. But most importantly, at some point, to come to the place, and that may not be <laughs> the first day that you talk about these things, it may take a while, but to ask this important question that we looked at this morning, why did Jesus die on the cross? And as I said last week, most people are like, I don't have a clue. I don't know. But when you can begin to tie all these pieces together, that say, like, well, no, Jesus died on the cross for you to pay your penalty to help you live right, and he wants to, Jesus wants to be your friend forever. All of a sudden, that's when the light bulb comes on. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I need that. I want that. So I think we can learn these simple things from this story. But without people understanding why Jesus died on the cross, Christianity will not make any sense to them. It'll just be, it's like, oh, it's just a religion. Jesus really won't make any sense to them. It's like, yeah, he was just a man, maybe a good teacher. And the Bible really won't make any sense. It's like, oh, it's just a history book, it's just a story book. But then to realize, oh, no, wait a minute. As Jesus said, all of this fits together. It all fits together as a pieces of many of a one puzzle, and that's what we need to help people understand. So let's take a moment to pray, and then we're going to sing a song and be done. Father, I thank you that this is how you ended the book of Luke. Not really as I would write it, or maybe we would write it, with everyone seeing Jesus in his glorified state and everyone falling down and worshiping him. That's, what we would, that's how we would write this story, but that's not how you chose to do it. You chose to finish the book of Luke to make sure that everyone understands the reason that Jesus really died on the cross. Because without understanding that, the story really is a whole completely different story. So today we are so, I am so grateful for the Lord Jesus for his willingness to come to earth 2,000 years ago and intentionally to come here on mission, on purpose, to die on the cross. Not just to be a good teacher or to be a healer or to be a celebrity, but to be our savior, the one to redeem us from our sins, and not just for the nation of Israel, but for all people, including us today. So God, I pray that for each of us, we would understand this truth of why Jesus really died and for those that are listening to my voice today on, on live stream, that everyone would clearly understand why Jesus died and what it means to us today, that we're forgiven, that we can have this new life, this new transformation, and that we can be friends with God, this personal relationship with God forever. So thank you for Luke and how he has revealed to us these great truths as Jesus has been going to a meal or at a meal or leaving a meal, that he's brought all this together and it's like, wow, we learned so much that we didn't understand before. And to that end, I would pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand, and Josiah is going to lead us in this great closing song. And I hear the Savior say, thy strength watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it Oh, 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 oh,
Okay, you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. We are in the season now of Operation Christmas Child, and we do this every year as a church. So let's focus on the screen, and we're going to show you a short video explaining what this is all about. Three, two, one! And when those lids come off those boxes, you have never seen such pure joy. So many smiles, the children just become wild and crazy. It's indescribable. To watch that child open that box for the very first time and see the look on their faces, it's amazing that God used a simple shoebox to bring that much joy. This is amazing as you can see the children's faces, they're excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. Thank you. We are very happy. God bless you. Yay! These people back behind us, they're giving their time. Families have given boxes, the enthusiasm, the excitement, it's off the charts. We're just so thankful for these volunteers. We couldn't do it without them. They are the heart of the ministry. And because of them, many children, like even me, accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. What children need more than anything is love, hope, and faith in God. Every shoebox gift is an opportunity to share your faith. We thank you for this ministry that is yours that you use a shoebox gift to go around the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It starts with a simple shoebox gift, and from there, these gifts go around the world and are given to each child. It could be in a pickup truck, it could be at the top of a bus, the roof of a taxi, camels and donkeys, canoes going up the river, whatever it takes to get these gifts into the hands of children. And that's only the beginning. After children receive the box, they get to go through a 12-lesson discipleship course. And these children, they're committing their lives to Christ. And they get to share their faith with other children. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a certificate and a Bible in their own language. My name is Romina Alejandra. I really like to draw and cook. One day, I was drawing and I wanted some markers. 
and I asked my mother if she could buy them for me. She said no, because she didn't have the money. Today, we received gift boxes. When I opened the box and saw the markers, I was very excited. I learned about God through the box. Today, I prayed that Jesus would come into my heart. I am very grateful to everyone, to God, and to you all for bringing me this box. This box provides the opportunity to put a smile on a child's face, gets them to know more about Jesus Christ, and also be disciples so that they can be disciple makers in the world. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. We have seen churches being planted. We have seen people being transformed. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. This is incredible. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just the child, but the whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. Whole big display. If you haven't seen that, there are boxes that are prepared so you can just take them and fill them. They need to come back by the middle of November. So I think many of you know exactly what to do with that project. Next Sunday, we're having a baptism service right here. So for those that are not familiar with this building, we're going to take those four uh, pieces of plywood. We'll take those up. There's a 700-gallon tank here that will be filled for next Sunday. There are two people that are confirmed and all ready to go. But let me say this. It's not too late. If you've never been baptized, you would like to be baptized, there's still time. Talk to me today as soon as possible. So that's next Sunday. A week from tomorrow is Trunk or Treat out here in the church parking lot. Again, it's not too late to take part. And uh, if you can't take part but you'd like to donate candy, you can certainly go and do that and drop that off next Sunday, and that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so at this time we're going to say farewell to our friends on Facebook Live. Uh, we are having our potluck luncheon 